The idea of panoramic images can be traced back to 20 AD and the murals painted on the walls of the villas in Pompeii. Panoramas were also popular ways to depict large landscapes in paintings, particularly in the late 1700s and early 1800s when artists were sharing vast outdoor spaces with their audiences. It was even a common practice at the time to build large buildings and rooms to house and display 360 degree panoramic vistas. One of the first recorded patents for a panoramic camera was issued in Austria in 1843. The following year, a more successful and technically superior panoramic camera was assembled in Germany. This camera used curved photographic plates and a set of gears, which provided a relatively steady panning speed, resulting in a properly exposed image over the entire width of the negative. Due to the cost of materials and the difficulty of properly obtaining these images, they were fairly rare. To overcome the shortcomings, photographers would take anywhere from two to a dozen images and place them together to create panoramic images such as this 1851 panoramic of San Francisco. It's believed that this panorama was comprised of 11 plates, but these no longer exist. This technique was also used during the Civil War by George Barnard, a photographer for the Union Army, to create vast overviews of fortifications and terrain, much valued by engineers, generals, and artists of the time. Following the invention of flexible film in 1888, panoramic photography was revolutionized with dozens of cameras that were more portable and simpler to operate and with the advantage of holding several panoramic views on one roll of film. On my recent trip to South Carolina, I saw a really cool collection of scouting panoramic photographs owned by Chris Jensen. Chris agreed to let me interview him about his collection, so today we'll learn more about panoramic scouting photographs in this edition of Artifact of the Week. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Tell us, you've got this really cool collection of these panographic photographs. How did you get involved in collecting panographic photographs? The panoramic photographs first got my attention when I saw one of the 1920 World Jamboree and I started realizing all the people in this photograph are dead. This is the only image of them probably scouting has. And it was so clear and so distinctive. If, if that was your grandfather, you could have identified him. The photographs are so large that, I don't know, they just they grab you. So you've, how many do you have in your collection? I have about 260. And so I'm really good friends with a frame shop. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what kind of subject matters are captured in these panoramas? Oftentimes they're a contingent to a world jamboree or a national jamboree, or they're a, a big troop or a special event of some sort. Like they were collecting, you know, peach pits or walnut shells for gas masks of World War One. Of the ones that you've got, what would you say are some of your favorite or the ones that evoke the most emotion for you? It, it's the ones for World Jamborees. You know, they're getting ready to head out of the country on a long trip because they're going by steamship. Or it's they're in the midst of doing a service project. They're, they're collecting stuff for a war effort. What kind of time frame are covered by most of the, the images you have? The, the prime period for panoramic photographs was from about 1910 up through about World War II, about the 40s. How, how do they get these pictures? Because I understand that the negative is roughly the size of the image that's printed. So how do they uh, uh, capture these? It's a special camera. The camera is huge. It has to be on a tripod and very slow film, meaning it takes forever to capture the image on that film and the lens is a slit and the camera actually pans by the image that they want to take. It oftentimes takes 30 to 40 seconds to get the picture done. And because of that, it creates this giant negative wrapped around the back of the camera. Um, when they do that, because the lens is a slit it is in complete focus from 
complete left to complete right of the negative so that there's no place that's out of focus. Normally you have a parallax problem, so on the left and the right will be slightly out of focus and the center will be in focus. With a panoramic photograph, it's in focus all the way across because it's the same distance from the lens to any part of that negative. To develop the negative, they put it in the solution, develop it, then they lay it directly onto the paper that they want to expose. So there's no other lens to cause parallax problems. They turn the lights on in the room, expose the paper for a certain amount of time, develop it, and you have a one-to-one -one negative size to paper size. Wow, that's pretty cool. Now, you've got all these pictures. Do you happen to have one of those cameras? I'm looking for one. It's on my wish list. <laughs> I want one. Um, the last time I saw one on eBay, it wasn't working. The bellows were deteriorating, got little pinholes of light. Uh, but it was still $1,700. And I've just, I've never seen one in person. I've seen a few online to buy. There's a Russian version they tried making called a Nimlo. Um, it's actually multiple lenses, and they try to do a panoramic out of it, but you, it's not the same. You go out of focus, in focus, out of focus, in focus, all the way across the negative, which looks long and pretty, but it'll give you a headache looking at it. You can personally check out Chris's collection by visiting his business at 115 Seiko Lowell Road in Easley, South Carolina. Here at the National Scouting Museum, we have several panoramic images in the collection and on display. Over at the Via Fulmonte, we have images of Hawkeye Ranch prior to the construction of the villa. We have a couple of images of Rayado Lodge and this image of a cattle roundup. There's also a cool image captured when Vice President Dawes visited the ranch. These two images are of the Cherokee Car Company, which Wade Phillips was involved in, and the Cimarron Maverick Club Rodeo. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Join us next time as we continue to learn more about the history of the BSA through the collection of the National Scouting Museum and Artifact of the Week.